Um, I'm going to talk to you about the gut uh, microbiome and the bacteria in our gut. Um, this is a, something I took out of a magazine that I don't read too often called Discover Magazine. And I'm just going to read it to you because I thought it was says everything I need to say. You're sitting alone, completely outnumbered. Your body is home to trillions of tiny passengers. Those are bacteria. For every cell in your body, there's 100, 150 bacteria. Um, that's, that's your microbiome. It's got a huge impact on your health. Those bacteria help you digest. Those bacteria make vitamins and minerals that you reabsorb. Those bacteria really define who you are. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. <clears throat> but we, in turn, affect them. All of the food we eat, the probiotics we eat, the environment we live in, uh, how we were born, etc., changes our bacteria. So there is this to-and-fro relationship. I do have some disclosures. Uh, Faring Pharmaceuticals makes a probiotic called uh, VSL-3. Well, and uh, Danon obviously is a sponsor of this meeting, and I've done research with both those organizations. I want you to learn a little bit about the microbiome and how it originates. So microbiome, what we're talking about is the bacteria in your gut. I want you to understand how that affects your body and to learn how you can change that microbiome in a meaningful way. So, this is really what it looks like. And un unlike Chris Gigiboich, I don't have any data. I don't have any slides. I just have cartoons. So, <clears throat> we're made up of about five pounds of bacteria. So if you want to lose weight quickly, that's how you do it. Most of it's in our gut. Um, and we have an interaction between our body and those bacteria. The zoo inside you. So I've mentioned in that little blurb that I read that your body contains a hundred times more bacteria that live in there than you have individual uh, body cells. So you are mainly one big walking bacteria. And they're everywhere. Every part of your body, obviously the majority inside your intestine, but in your airways, in your blood, in your lymph glands, obviously on your skin, in your eye, there are bacteria. And those bacteria are changeable. And those bacteria drive how you function and maybe even how you live. So this is titled your first birthday gift or your zeroth first birthday gift. I didn't know if zeroth was a name it was a word, but I made it up anyway. So when you're born a few minutes before you're born, you are relatively sterile from a bacterial standpoint. Your gut is sterile. Your skin is sterile. Every part of you has, has almost no bacteria. And you are populated with bacteria as you're born through the, through the vagina, through the birth canal. Those bacteria that are there is what you get colonized with. And so every one of you was colonized in that way. And then, after you're born, you have a bit more time for more colonization because all of those parents and grandparents and, and other kids, you know, they kiss you and they grab you and they slobber on you and they pass their bacteria to you. And that became your microbiome. And that microbiome doesn't change. In fact, by the age of two or three, your microbiome, your bacteria are like your fingerprint. 
there's very little you can do to permanently change it. And it's really interesting that we allow that change, somehow our gut allows that change, allows us to grow this microbiome, and then at some point in time stops us from accepting new bacteria in any permanent way. And it's probably complex beyond what we can imagine because all of these bacteria live there sort of like in big condos, you know, in, in your intestine. And it depends who gets there first. So if Mr. Lactobacillus arrives on the ground floor, then who's ever on the second floor is going to be different. And if Mr. If Mr. Bacteroides arrives to live on the ground floor, then who's ever on the second floor is going to be different. So it sort of depends how you've been exposed and what order you've been exposed and who you're exposed to. And so you can see it is like an individual fingerprint and each of us is going to be different than everybody else. You are what you eat. So now I told you that you're colonized with your microbiome <clears throat> early on in life. And you get a lot of it in those first few days, but you also have a couple of years, two to three years, where it's changeable. And food plays a role in that. And then ongoing, food plays a role in it. So I put two types of diet you got the donuts, and you got the grain. And then there's two types of people who have different physiques. Now, so I'm only implying that perhaps if you ate those donuts, you might look like that, and perhaps if you ate the grain, you might look like that. But the importance is that both of those humans in that picture are going to have a different microbiome. Not only because they were born different and they had that microbiome fingerprint, but because over their life they are eating different food, and those different foods are allowing a different type of microbiome to continue and exist. So you are what you eat. Now, I've told you that you're colonized. It's like your fingerprint. You can change it by the type of diet that you're eating. And globally, we change it by society. So we have a high-fat diet in a, in a Western diet and a lower-fat diet um, in other parts of the world. And so there's going to be some big changes in the type of microbiomes that Western people have versus, say, a developing country. So that's known. But think of now how that affects your body. So th that's how bacteria affect you, but how, or that's how you affect bacteria, but how do bacteria affect your body? Guts to brains. It is absolutely clear, lots of animal studies, now some human studies, this brown mouse, when he has one type, he or she, I don't know, it's a he or she, I can't tell, has one type of bacteria in the gut, is going to be less anxious less nervous, less likely to crawl into a, a mouse hole than if they have an, another bacteria. You can absolutely change the anxiety level of a mouse by changing the bacteria in their gut. So you wonder why some days you eat something and you wake up, wake up a little sort of edgy? Maybe it's because you're changing the bacteria in your gut. We can certainly do that in animal studies. And we can feed people different diets, measure their gut microbiome, demonstrate that we've made a change, and they, they score differently on the Beck depression score, on the anxiety score. So there's a link between your gut and your brain. How does that link occur? Is it hormonal? Clearly, the gut is a large hormonal organ with a lot of hormones that it controls. Maybe that's the link. It's not quite clear, but what is clear is the microbiome can change your mind. Guts to beefy, bacteria that make you fat. 
As Dr. Gramlich put up one of those slides from the Harvard uh, group, one of the captions and news stories was something like, uh, fat teenagers eat less but are still overweight or something like that. You know what? Fedorix decided that it has nothing to do with how much you eat, really. As it does a bit, but it's, it's your gut bacteria. You're fat because your gut bacteria are wrong. This, is a, this was a very famous study. It's quite old already now. Jeffrey Gordon from the University of Washington had these two mice. These are the same mice. They're genetically identical. They should look identical. What's, what's different? Yeah, one of them's a little hefty. The only difference in these mice were that the larger obese one had a different type of bacteria in their gut. Everything else about that mouse was identical to the other one. And then, when Jeff took the bacteria from the fat mouse and gave it to the thin mouse, the thin mouse got fat. And if he gave the bacteria from the thin mouse to the fat mouse, the fat mouse got thin. Hmm, that's interesting. How would that happen? Just different microbiomes. But imagine that there was a different bacteria. And there are some of these bacteria are responsible for metabolizing carbohydrates. Imagine what would happen to you as an individual person if you had a certain type of bacteria that just allowed you to every day metabolize your carbohydrates a little bit better and you absorbed an extra 100 calories a day or 50 calories a day. What would that do to you over a lifetime? You know, you'd be a little bigger, probably. So, gut bacteria, your microbiome determining not only whether you're smart or anxious, but also your size. This is interesting. <clears throat> One of the things we've been doing uh, lately is called metagenomics, and that's uh, taking and looking at the genes in your gut bacteria. We were so surprised to recognize that a lot of those gut bacteria that we have in our gut, they're most, they're not even made up of, bac they're not even made, they, they don't even have a lot of bacterial genes in them anymore. A lot of them have incorporated food genes. So imagine you have a bacteria, and we'll call it bacteria bacteroides. It's made up of bacteroides genes, because that's what it is, and it's got broccoli genes incorporated into it. It's got tobacco virus incorporated into it. In, in this study, they looked at uh, this uh, bacteria, Zobella. I don't know what that is. But it's in seaweed. It ends up in Japanese peoples incorporated into their bacteria. So it becomes part of their microbiome. A seaweed gene ending up inside their bacteria. So it becomes part of them. So that human eating that sushi becomes part plant because that plant gene is now incorporated into their bacterial genes in their gut. And whatever that plant gene does has the opportunity to translate that to the human. Genetic loans. So, <clears throat> I've told you that you get colonized, it's like a fingerprint, your food can change it, and then it's got all these bacteria in your gut that you, you, know, you, you had no choice that they were there, and all of a sudden it's affecting your brains and your, your size, and, and then there's, geez, you're picking up genes from, back, from uh, the broccoli you eat at lunch. You know, it's hopeless. Those bacteria for the most part, are good for you because they help you stay healthy and digest food. But they can also become unfriendly. And they can become unfriendly in many different ways. One of the ways, and I talked to you about this genetic loans, where they actually pick up genes from other 
foods and other bacteria, and those things can lurk there for a long time. And as dietitians and healthcare professionals, you've, you know, you've often heard people say, you know, I was, I was well, I got a cold, and then all of a sudden I got sick. So something triggered me to get sick. And it could be because these genetic signatures sit in your microbiome and just wait for an opportunity for you to become stressed, for you to become fatigued or whatever, and then they take over and you get sick. Allies to unfriendlies. And what allows these unfriendlies to take over? I've listed a few here. Medications take antibiotics. It changes your microflora for a while. Stress, all sorts of stress hormones can encourage what I call bad bacteria growth. Our topic for today, diet. Sugars, preservatives, alcohol, all these processed foods, all of these things change your microflora and can allow these quote, bad bacteria to flourish. Let's circle all the way back to probiotics. <clears throat> Friendly bacteria, probiotics, unfriendly bacteria. So probiotics can protect your lumen from unfriendly bacteria. This is a little, another little cartoon, a series of cartoons. The red blob represents a bacteria, the middle part is your intestine, and then the two green blobs rec represent your mucosal immune system. So just follow along here. You get probiotics. They really prevent these bad bacteria from coming across. Remember I used the condominium analogy, right? Now these probiotics are like they're like a big army, a, a sieve preventing translocation of those bacteria. These probiotics regulate immune response. They put out immunoglobulins into the gut. They stimulate these dendritic cells to, to make your whole gut anti-inflammatory so you don't get ongoing inflammation. They have antimicrobial activity. Chicken farmers and pig farmers have figured this out. They give chickens and pigs all sorts of probiotics in order that those animals grow bigger and don't, don't get sick. These probiotics enhance barrier activity. They actually increase mucus production. They tighten up your tight junctions. Oops, I just skipped along here. They do all sorts of things to your, to your immune system. Imagine. Every one of these nine things that I've listed on this slide here, it's not important to remember what they are, but just remember, these probiotics, these good bacteria, actually have physiological changes to all sorts of things. Your gut, your mucosal immune system, your systemic immune system, just by lining themselves there in the intestine. Where can I find these probiotics? You can find them in yogurts. You can find them in individual probiotic packages, VSL3. You should visit that booth at the back. They make a probiotic, which is eight different probiotics in a powder. The non makes a probiotic by putting it in, into yogurt. You can get these probiotics in different ways. These are proven good bacteria that have benefit. We won't go into prebiotics, but you can actually improve the amount of endogenous probiotics you have by giving them food. So I'm going to end. Here are my learning objectives. I wanted you to learn how the microbiome, what it is, and how it originates. So it begins at birth. It's pretty stable after you're two to three years old, like your fingerprint. And it's made up of these friendlies and unfriendlies that sort of coexist. How does it affect your body? There's lots of crosstalk between these friendlies and unfriendlies in amongst themselves, but also through hormonal changes, your, your gut immune system, your systemic immune system that can affect every part of your body from your brain on down to the number of fat cells you have. You cannot change permanently your microbiome that you were born with. You can alter it by the food you eat and you can alter it temporarily with probiotics and prebiotics that really provide a, a more friendly type of bacterial environment.
the human microbiome. It's a new science, and it will, in the next decade, fundamentally change, I think, how we as healthcare providers talk to patients about nutrition and their diet. So with that, I'll end, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Two quick questions. Um, one, you mentioned bacteria, but I'm wondering um, what is kind of considered the norm in terms of is there supposed to be yeast as part of the normal flora? And um, so that's the first question. Are yeast part of, is, is yeast part of the normal flora? The answer is yes. Are viruses part of the normal flora? The answer is yes. Uh, so it's not only bacteria. That microbiome, in the bigger sense, contains fungi, viruses, and bacteria. That are supposed to be the normal kind, the ones that don't cause abnormal... And, and so we know l less about the fungi and the viruses, but we are assuming, through metagenomics, where we can actually look at the genetic profile of these things, that they live in some sort of symbiotic relationship and probably, over the eons... Have, are, are, have a, an advantage to be there. Okay. And the second I don't know question, if that's answered your question. But. Yeah, somewhat. Um, so the second question is um, actually related to what I get a lot of in the office is pa pa patients are always asking me, why am I now developing this food allergy or food intolerance and they never had a problem with that food before? Is it related to this bacteria or yeast change in their gut or what do you think? So your, your question is, food intolerance, is it related to the gut microbiome? Would that be the question, maybe? Yes, basically. I don't know. <laughs> um, I struggle with food intolerances, and maybe it's a, it's a question that we might have at the, at the panel, but how do you, what are those food intolerances? Uh, what's, what's driving them? Uh, you know, is the food intolerance to milk because of the milk protein? Is the food intolerance to milk because you're lactose deficient? Right? I mean, there's, there's so many elements around it. And yes, the microbiome can play a role. If you have a certain microbiome that's not able to digest fructose very well, then you're going to have a food intolerance perhaps to fruit, some sorts of fruits that have a large fructose. If, on the other hand, you have a microbiome that really is very efficient at metabolizing fructose, you may not have that, quote, food intolerance. And so what we have lumped under food intolerance today, I, I think, reflects a little bit of our naivety and the understanding around, you know, how we actually manage food, digest food, handle food, because we've focused on the physiology of that absorption for all these years and really ignored what was going on in the lumen, mainly because we couldn't measure it. Even when we... T so... We will take a sample of someone's stool and we will do the best potential sequencing, genetic sequencing we can do of all the bacteria that are there. 80% of the, the genes that we find are unknown. Right? Even with our best technology and our best mapping, 80% of what's in your gut, we don't even know what's there. I mean, we see a gene. We don't know what the name of that gene is. We don't know what bacteria it belongs to. We don't know anything. So we have a lot to learn yet. I'm, I'm not a healthcare professional, but I have a person who suffers from acid reflux. So I'm starting to think that is there a correlation between the gut and acid reflux disease? I'm so happy that we have Dr. Richard Hunt here, who is the world's expert on acid reflux. And, and Richard will be speaking to you. Is it, but your question was... Acid reflux in the gut? The bacteria in acid reflux? Well, there is perhaps with a bacteria called H. pylori, but I'll let Dr. Hunt tell you more about that. He's got a great talk to tell you. There was a question over here. See, this side's dominating now, so now we got this side here. Shout, and then I'll repeat the question. Um, the, the only studies on that I'm related, that I'm aware of are, are the mouse studies 
where feeding different diets to mice from birth changed their anxiety level. Now, you have to realize in a mouse how you measure anxiety level. You put it on a big table with a couple of holes, and the quicker it goes into its mouse hole, the, less, the more anxious it is. So, you know, but I think it is showing us over and over again that there is this connection, but still it's pretty crude. My hope was that you know, I could find some food and eat and get smarter. Right? That would be my hope, but so far I haven't found that. I'm trying everything I can. Yeah, a question, question here and then two at the back, yeah. So the, yeah, so the, the probi you, you, you probably need at least 10 to the 8th of those probiotics. You need to get it through your stomach acid. It needs to survive to get into that. It colonizes in your intestine. Our, you know, the work we did would show that within about 7 to 10 days for you to colonize enough that we can measure it on a regular basis. And the off rate is about the same. Once you stop taking that probiotic, 7 to 10 days later, we begin to see the, the drop-off where we can't, quite cultured any longer. So we haven't been able, so taking a probiotic of any sort is a temporary fix. You have to keep taking the probiotic in order to have that bacteria live in your gut. It doesn't automatically get recolonized. And I think that's the fingerprint issue, right? You're born with this fingerprint and it, it wants to keep this homeostasis that it was born with. So we had a couple of questions at the back and then we'll come to the front. It's different. It's diff so the question was, what happens to the microbiome if you're born by a C-section? It's different. Uh, and there are studies that say that some of those children have higher incidences of uh, eczema and other allergies. Um, an interesting study going on in Denmark to sort of address that question is that they've divided uh, children being born in one Denmark hospital into two groups. One group is just gets born and lives. The other group gets born but is fed a certain probiotic from day one. And so they're changing the flora in these children with a certain probiotic mixture in, in Denmark. Now, those kids are now coming up to six years old and they have less eczema, less psoriasis, less asthma. Now, you know, we'll see how that develops over time, but that's an interesting study that you could actually take these children, change their microbiome, and, and, and change their diseases as they grew up. Yes, over here. I'll go first and then Oh, sorry, the I didn't see the mic. Thank okay. you. That's okay. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, two very quick questions building on what another delegate has asked. Is there evidence to show that there's better or worse absorption of probiotics from food versus supplement? And then secondary to that, is there a best time for probiotic consumption, morning, night, with or without food? Um, I think my answer to both those questions is really, doesn't really matter. I think it's just a matter of, uh, so this answer is based off what I know in all of our animal studies on probiotics. It didn't really matter how we gave it, how we took it, as long as we gave enough on a continual basis. Uh, um, my question has to do, and I, I have so many questions for you, but I'll limit it to one. You only allowed one because Dr. Okay, Ledner is tapping, tapping his um, foot. The leaky gut is a term that we see pop up a lot more, and you just mentioned part of your presentation that probiotics help to tighten the junctions um, of the lining of the small intestine. I want to know your comments about this because I see Dr. Alessio Fasano, for example, talk about the leaky gut as a precursor to the development of celiac disease. Um, food allergies also tend to, to be linked to a leaky gut or food intolerances as well. I don't know what your experience is, and, and not your experience, but your comment on um, the leaky gut being um, a syndrome or a precursor to immunity or lower immunity and, um, and food allergies and intolerances, and whether um, probiotics can help with that. So, in, uh, in, so my comments will be related to inflammatory bowel disease. So in inflammatory bowel disease, you have a leaky, 
Uh, mice with a genetically predisposed leaky gut have a higher incidence of this inflammatory bowel disease and also you, you can induce it much easier in those animals. In humans, John Meddings and the group from the University of Calgary have done some work on this. There are humans uh, with a leaky gut uh, and they're following that cohort of people to see whether they develop celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease more frequently than those people without a leaky gut. Um, and so far, there are numerically more people in that group developing inflammatory bowel disease, uh, but it's yet not statistically different. But it, it, it probably makes sense that you would be born with a genetic mutation, you have a little bit of a leaky gut, and you're sieving through more of these bacterial proteins or other things that are triggering your mucosal immune system to always be active and, you know, if you're unlucky, there'll be a trigger that sets up an immune response that never gets shut down. So, you know, that is how we would think about that. We'll, um, we'll grab maybe two last questions and then we'll move on, um, just in the interest of time. There's one at the back here for you. No, you're okay? Um, one's one on the right. You'll have his. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the role or the application of the microbiome for people that think they're lactose or fructose or have other food intolerances. And how do you think we're going to be able to educate the public to deal with each of those, seeing as the public I deal with don't seem to know if they are really this. They're just guessing and trying to manage their diets like that. Sorry, I, I missed the first part of that. It was just hard to hear. Is there a, an effect of the microbiome for people that have or perceive food intolerances of lactose or fructose along those lines? And how do you think we'll be able to educate the public with this microbiome and the good and bad bacteria? So, yeah, you're a bit ahead, I think, of where, this, where we are yet with the science and the management. I don't think yet we have identified specific microbiomes for individual diseases yet or conditions yet. And so it's very difficult to say that you have a certain microbiome and you're going to be fructose intolerant and then we can, we can change that. I think we're still in the exploratory phase around how to, of just identifying that. Uh, but I do think, Cindy, there will become a time when we actually do have selected probiotics to fix some of these selected problems, uh, but we're not quite there yet. We're, uh, and it's mainly because the whole probiotic industry is, uh, and Health Canada is working on this, how we manage it, how we control it, what probiotics are actually in your capsules. There's so much on the internet being sold as probiotics, which are not really probiotics. We did a study in Edmonton where I, we went out and bought uh, 50 different probiotics, and nearly a third of them had nothing in them. Uh, and so, you know, uh, these, these were Internet products, right? And so we, we lack some of the regulations around that. So I'm going on in this tangent, but um, we have lots yet to learn about the microbiome and then how to apply fixes to it if it's broken. Last, last question? I hope uh, others have an interest in C. difficile because uh, that's my question. Uh, post C. difficile and post treatment, often the patient will have a, a specific scent or smell to their bowel movements. I'm wondering if, if it is still the case that their gut has repopulated with their own flora, and if it has, why is there this smell that seems to be a, affiliated with C. diff? Why is there this smell? Well, um, I don't know, but I'll tell you this. It's, it, it will be related to how they're repopulating their gut. Assuming the C. diff is gone, it's, it's, it's the repopulation that occurs. Uh, there's a, another new area of science. There's metagenomics. I told you about sequencing all the bacteri bacterial genes. There's a science called metabolomics that looks at small molecules that get excreted. You've seen on television these sniffing dogs who sniff people and say, well, you have cancer. You know what the dogs are sniffing? They're sniffing small molecule metabolites in the urine or, or coming out in the sweat. Um, 
and we can actually have you pee in a cup and we can tell you whether you have colonic polyps or, or whether you have cancer because of the small molecule profile. And then we look at that small molecule pro profile and those small molecules don't come from you. 80% of those small molecules in your urine are, are bacterial origin. And so the smell that the dogs are smelling in people with cancer relates to these small molecules that are of bacterial origin. And so circling back to your question, those people have a certain odor, I would think, because of the population of bacteria that repopulates. And, and that can then turn into a diagnostic test. And if you knew what bacteria they were, then you could treat them because that might be leading to recurrence. I mean, there's lots to do around that. I'll end here. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>